Stephen Gray. Stephen is an author, speaker, conference and workshop organizer, musician, and photographer. Basically, an awesome person. His first book, Returning to the Sacred World, was published in 2010. As of spring 2015, Stephen is just finishing up a new book with 17 contributors, and it's called Cannabis and Spirituality, A Guide to the Revival of an Ancient Wisdom Ally. This book will be published by Inner Traditions Park Street Press in 2016. Stephen has been a co-organizer of the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference in Vancouver for the past four years, which is a great forum in which we talk about all kinds of sacramental plants. The event is coming up on October 29th and 30th at UBC, and I believe there's a booth as well. You can get more info. Welcome, Stephen. Barbara, Barbara Harris is a consciousness researcher, therapist and author, and co-author of 10 books on healing from repeated trauma, the emotional needs of critical care patients, and integrating spiritual experiences. She spent six years at the University of Connecticut Medical School researching the after effects of people who had near-death experiences. She taught about these after effects at Roger University Institute for Alcohol and Drug Studies, calling her classes when the 12th step happens first. She's in private practice in Atlanta, Georgia, doing group and individual psychotherapy for adults that were repeatedly traumatized as children. She's also the author of this very nice book, The Secrets of Medicinal Marijuana, a guide for patients and those who care for them. I'll look forward to having it signed. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you. For the sake of time constraints, I'll just ask for another quick applause for Chris, who was already introduced early on, and thank you for the introduction to this panel. And last but not least, we have our friend Matt Barron, who's the owner of the House of the Great Gardener. Matt, Matt has been working with cannabis for the last 21 years. For 14 of those years, Matt has worked with numerous clubs across Canada. Matt has also successfully fought a six-year constitutional challenge in the BC Supreme Court regarding the MMAR program after the Vancouver Island Therapeutics Cannabis Research Institute was raided in 2004. So thank you very much for putting up that fight on behalf of everyone. After that win, he started the House of Great Gardener to give patients even more access to the medicine that worked best for them, access to the seed. Matt believes intention is a primary element when it comes to working with cannabis, and that shows with 25 international awards under his belt. All right. Great. So on, on this panel, we'll look forward to hearing of your personal connection to the plant and, in, and, and, and the spiritual sacramental use. Thank you, Chris, for introducing us at the beginning and an explanation of previous religions and key figures that have used the cannabis plant throughout the history. I'll start first perhaps with uh, Stephen on asking you, what is the open secret of how cannabis can function as a spiritual ally? Thank you. Uh, is this one on? Yeah. Uh, the open secret is the same open secret that underlies all genuine spiritual uh, philosophies. And that is, um, actually, uh, I was going to jot down, I'm, I thought I jotted down a few quotes from the 13th century mystical poet uh, Rumi, and I forgot to bring them. So, um, but I, I, Rumi almost sums up the whole thing for me about what this open secret actually means. It's not specific at all to cannabis. I'll say a little about that as I answer the question. Um, Rumi says, Rumi has poems that say things like, don't let, uh, don't let your thoughts cover over the moon of your heart. Another one is something like, uh, let go of thinking so you can drink the pure nectar of this moment. Um, another one, uh, my favorite actually is, silence is the language of God, all else is poor translation. <laughs> A um, little bit of a humor in that one, actually. Um, so, uh, 
you know, cannabis, as we're seeing in this remarkable weekend, has uh, multiple very powerful, very effective benefits for people, uh, and it can be used to enhance and improve a number of activities, creative, uh, creative activities, et cetera, et cetera, medicinal, obviously, and so on. But I want to stress this one area that I would say is underrepresentative or under-understood in the same way that it's under-understood uh, in general, which is that if you can get yourself out of the way, if you can um, allow uh, what they sometimes call head traffic to dissolve and empty into the moment, uh, this is where cannabis comes in, so to speak, because uh, in the non-scientific way of describing it, it's what you might call a non-specific amplifier. So uh, it, it, it will, uh, you know, there's a lot of science to say why or how this happens, but in the non-scientific way, uh, cannabis amplifies wherever your intention is or what, what, wherever your direction is. So um, if you have negative ideation, it'll, it can enhance and put out a perspective of that as well. But if you can pay attention, if you can let go of head traffic, if you can sit still for a little while uh, and just let the plant be your whole experience in that moment, it can deepen your meditation. It can open you up into a place of peace and uh, awakened heart, open heart, awakened heart, as the Buddhists call it. That's the short answer. I could go on about it for half an hour, but I better stop there. Thank you, thank you. Um, in, in relation to that, so for people who are interested in cannabis, but also a broader family of intuitions, I'd like to ask the panel how cannabis can work with and support encounters with other intuitions and perhaps, Matt, you would like to speak a little bit about your personal experience and, and take, uh, your take on this. Uh, I, yeah, I think you're probably referring to the same one I talked to in Toronto, which is my personal uh, ayahuasca journeys and uh, cannabis. Uh, and really, it came down to the fact that uh, they're just both such powerful entities. And I was so ingrained in the cannabis culture itself that I found a real... I, although I found uh, humongous uh, enlightenment in the ayahuasca journeys I've done, uh, cannabis for me is such a strong teacher that I sort of honor the two and respect the fact that cannabis is more of my teacher than ayahuasca. But uh, at the same time, I know uh, many of ayahuasca circles that incorporate cannabis use uh, rather than tobacco use. So really, it, it, you know, it's an individual thing. It's... it's you know, it's, it's not something I think that you can put a broad, broad blanket on everybody and say, you know, this is the way. Like, I, I could tell you that that was the way for me. Uh, okay. Everybody's different, though. Of course, okay. And, and Chris, perhaps, um, do you have references when we talk about spiritual or religious context or some of the key individuals in the history of cannabis that, again, ties into this broader, maybe mixed with other plants or in general? Certainly, you know, uh, as that commercial says about the hot sauce, that shit goes with everything. <laughs> and it's true of cannabis because it's acting on different receptors than those other psychoactive things, and it can make the intense experience of a psychedelic journey, journey more digestible and mellow you out a little bit so that you can actually uh, go into it with a little less fear. Uh, figures like Aleister Crowley, for instance, would use uh, cannabis in conjunction with mescaline-containing substances for that, that very purpose, you know what I mean, to get more out of the experience. Okay, okay. Um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, I think uh, your work, Barbara, is uh, not only very uh, amazing and honorable, but I'd like us to bring the, the, the focus in terms of how you're using and how can ha cannabis help with essentially people who are dying and then through their passage. And if you could share with us some experiences, because it's a very deep one. Yeah. Um, well, I died in 1975 while suspended in a uh, circle bed after breaking my spine and having five and a half hours of surgery. And um, when I died, I woke up out in the hallway and went through a tunnel, met with my grandmother. I was an atheist before this happened. And my grandmother had been dead for 14 years. Um, and then I went through an elaborate life review where I read visited my entire 32 years and had this 
very powerful feeling of being held by this amazing energy that later on I could call God. At the time, I couldn't, but I was being held by God. And, and, and what God showed me of my 32 years is that relationship is what we're here for. We're here to learn how to relate to ourselves, others, and if we so choose, God. Fast forward about two years, I became a healthcare provider because I wanted to help other people like I had been helped and wound up doing home care for the dying. And while I was in the body cast for seven months, somebody had given me a joint and two inhales from that joint and I flushed all my Percocet, all my Valium and all my sleeping pills down the toilet and I just smoked cannabis for the rest of my time and kept re re going over my life review. So I wound up doing home care for the dying. And I had one sweet little grandma who was really so gorked, is the word we used to use, on Percocet. And I really wanted her to be alert and awake because I knew she was gonna die very shortly. So I walked out of her room and I asked her grandson who was visiting her for the last time, I said, you know, I don't want to get you into trouble, but is there any way you could get a hold of some cannabis for your grandma? And he looked at me and he said, yeah, I'll go to my car. <laughs> and together we did this ritual where she got off the Percocet and started using cannabis with her grandson. And he started giving her memories that he had of her when he was little. And she started giving him memories back and I realized we were in a life review. This woman was having a life review the way I did with God. So we said a prayer and we asked God to come into the life review. And then we asked some other relatives to come into the life review. And together we actually sat and shared cannabis, found out everybody else was smoking it too. They just weren't telling each other. And ever since then, that was 40 years ago, I help people that are dying to have a life review. And I invite them to get some cannabis from their grandkids if they can, or we do it without. But my point here is that my experience with helping people die is that dying is not the grim reaper, it's the light. And this plant that we call cannabis has a soul of its own and it wants to have a relationship with the dying person. It wants to help them to go into the process without being afraid, but feeling the feminine, I think it's the feminine energy of the cannabis leading them towards the light. So that's the kind of work I do and I've got, I've got a chapter on this in, a, in my book. And one more thing, indica is for dying people. Okay, because it relaxes them, it brings them down. Okay. Thank you. So I'm assuming that obviously in, in, in those kind of sessions, the, what I call the set and setting is also a very important uh, factor. Uh, again, perhaps maybe starting with uh, you, Stephen, would you like to speak a little bit about why this is uh, important? for spiritually beneficial work with cannabis, the setting and the context in which that's done. Sure. Um, how many people are familiar with uh, the phrase set and setting in regard to the use of psychedelics, entheogens, and so on? Yeah. So that's about half of you. Uh, for the other half, um, set, this is the real short answer, set refers to everything you bring to an encounter with a psychedelic or entheogenic medicine plant. Um, your intention, your background, your general state of mind, your current state of mind, all that stuff. And the setting is the actual physical environment that you do it in. So um, it's said by many people involved with the so-called major entheogens, you know, the psilocybin and ayahuasca and so on, that uh, set and setting are really important to having a successful beneficial experience. Cannabis is, I would say, more forgiving than that in general, uh, than some of those are in some ways, but also it comes down to your intention. So, uh, as I mentioned when I spoke a few moments ago, uh, whatever your intention is, whether it's conscious or unconscious, cannabis can amplify that particular intention. So, if you're set coming in is that you have an intention that you want to heal 
You want to wake up. You want to open your heart. You want to find peace. And you do it in, you know, I would say it more, maybe a little more flexible setting-wise than some of the other medicines, which you may want to do in a circle, in a teepee, in a yurt, whatever, you know. Cannabis uh, uh, will allow many different environments. Uh, it loves nature, and nature loves it, for example. But, um, uh, you know, having a setting that feels comfortable and safe, non-distracted one way or another, can be a very important part of going deeper with cannabis and allowing the natural healing and awakening that life offers us to occur. Thank you again. Uh, yeah. Matt, exactly. Where I was going with was the theme of intention. Yeah, just intention. So I come at it a little bit more as a, as a sort of grower that's been working with compassion clubs, that's been working with medical people, that's been needs sort of medical grade cannabis and for me it's, it, it really is a spiritual journey I used to hang out with an old shamanic drum circle group that taught me the ways of drumming and and journeying and setting your intention and finding the answer and for me back in the day my only question was how do I make cannabis better how, how can I make my weed better I'm growing weed I want to make it better how do I do that and it really came down to intention and in a, on a lot of the journeys, they started off with, well, what's your intention? What do you grow weed for? And at the time, I was growing weed f to pay my bills. So they were like, you know, oh, your intention is to make money. And eventually what happened was I was, and it was during an ayahuasca trip that I was really shown the visual example of what these teachings were all about. It was, uh, it was, it was really a guy on a bicycle, and he, and he was the dealer. And he went up to the guy that was buying weed, but the weed was grown with the intention to make money. So the guy gr drove up, and, uh, and then he had the weed, and the guy had the money. And then the moment that the money and the weed were changed hands, the bag of, of cannabis lit up with a bright blue light. And, and, and at the time, it was the tall, slender, blue beings of the ayahuasca land. They were like... That's what happens. That's what the intention of the cannabis, because the cannabis plant understands your intention, and the cannabis plant wants to work symbiotically with you. It wants to please you as much as you want to please it. And if your intention is to grow that cannabis for money, well, then that, well, that's what the pl cannabis plant's going to do. So at the moment the money was exchanged, the cannabis reached its energetic blue light, just penetrating out of the bag. And the guy put the weed in his bag, and then the other guy, the guy, that he went home, and as he was walking home, the blue light was slowly diminishing. By the time he got home and he rolled it up and he smoked it, there was no more blue light in the, in the weed that he smoked. And then, the, and then the blue beings are like, okay, well now we're gonna show you an example of what it's like to grow weed when you put the intention to make somebody feel better into your growing. And the same, the same scenario started. The guy on the bike came rolling up, and the, and the, and the guy bought the weed, and the and exchange happened, and no blue light. And the guy walked home and rolled up the joint and sat back on his couch, and then he lit the joint up. And as he lit up, the blue light filled the whole guy up, and the whole guy was lighting with blue light. And they were like, and that's the difference. So, you know, the, where, when your intention is set on a sort of spiritual level, there is something more that occurs within the cannabis that you're smoking. So you sort of have to ask yourself, and then, and I've been working with the Vancouver Island Kabashin Club for 15 years, and uh, we've gotten to the point where all the genetic selections that we do for new strains, they're all put to the members of the club, and the members of the club sort of tell us which ones, which ones work best for them. So the entire seed bank that we run, every single strain on the seed bank has been tested in the clubs. We know their medicinal strains. It's pretty interesting when you, can, when you can put five new strains to the members of a club and right away, boom, number four. Number four is, is the one that everybody likes. And the, great, the crazy thing is that it's always different from the one that I like. So if it was me that was doing the genetic breeding, and, it's, and the one that I always like is usually one that people like the least. So if it was me doing the genetic selection, you wouldn't really be getting the medicinal properties that the people that actually want the medicinal properties are looking for, because I was the one doing the selection. So. Thank you. Please yeah, you know, panel. Andrew Wheel termed cannabis an active placebo, and with cannabis, intent is everything. You know, if you're smoking some dope before you sit down or your Xbox, 
you're going to get a different experience than some sadhu who's banging it off his third eye before sitting down to his yogic practices. And uh, when it was a major medicine in the 19th century, people were taking very potent extracts. There's actually surprisingly few accounts of people writing about it for its psychoactive purposes, uh, psychoactive effects in this time period, because what they felt was better. They were taking medicine, and they were taking it was better. And that's largely due also to a lot of the anxiety around cannabis use in our modern times. It's all the prohibitions and all the thoughts about that that, that contributed to those uh, effects of anxiety. And uh, if you really want to enrich your cannabis, Find out the history of it because it's the sacred history of cannabis is a fascinating thing and it will turn, the more you educate yourself about it, it will turn this plant from a despised weed to, weed to a literal tree of life. Great, great. Thank you. Barbara, do you want to share on that topic? Yeah. So if you're going to grow cannabis to help you or a family member, the way I like to do it is to start your intention when it's a seed, to hold the seed in your hands and let the seeds feel your energy and in its energy. And then when it's planted and it's growing, I like to put my hands on either side every day, twice a day, three times a day, and visualize that plant helping my relative. And when we harvest the cannabis, we ask it permission. And when we give it, we give it with the intention of healing. And what I like to do is have my relative or my patient hold it in their hand and ask it to be what they want it to be. What is the reason they are going to ingest this? What is the reason they're going to take the soul of the medicine into their soul? And what I found long ago, because I had been a sitter for quite a while for people that wanted to grow from MDMA, was that you can ask cannabis to be MDMA. You can ask it to be ecstasy. You can ask it to be ayahuasca. You can ask it to be whatever you want. And that soul will let you know right away if it's possible. And that's the intention for the set and setting. So ask it, commune with it, have a relationship with it. Okay. I certainly honor and respect for anyone who puts that kind of intention and honors the sacredness of the plant in their consumption. So thank you very much for that. I believe we have um, a few minutes. Uh, I'm not sure if this time is for the panel or for including the question and answers, but we definitely wanted to make sure that people in the crowd could also come up and ask any question and make this a little bit of more of an open conversation. So if you have questions, please feel free to start lining up at the, at the microphone. And maybe in, in the meantime, I'll ask you, uh, um, Barbara, maybe to lead a, a final answer here. You know, in, in conducting these sessions, and especially for people that are dying, what are some of the after effects of this awakening of spirituality in them at such a sensitive time? So if oh, you could what a question. A little bit for us. Um, I have a book called Spiritual Awakenings, and that book came from helping people die because what happens is, first of all, when you're helping someone die, you have to find out who they feel safe with in their family. And the safe ones are allowed to be part of what I'm about to describe. And that's that we're caring for that person at the very end, we're not drugging them. We may be sharing cannabis with them, but we're not giving them hard drugs, and we're attending to them. And part of the attending is a laying on of hands that we do, where we pray with them. From one to six people can be doing this for the dying person, including kids as young as three, okay? And then, um, we, it's hard to explain in a short answer, but I have to tell you that once they pass, there's a sense of joy among those of us that were in that inner circle caring for them. And that sense of joy is that they finally have released. They're through with the pain, and we know that they're going on now without pain to a new joy. So for the couple of days until the funeral or the memorial service, we're actually in a spiritual experience with them. We are not grieving yet. We know grieving will come later but we've just experienced a ceremony together that is as joyful as birth. You know, this is another birth. They're moving on to the next reality. So we all experience their peace. 
and some of the people that I've been with have actually seen them going into the light. But then once the ritual of the burial is over or the cremation, everybody comes down. <laughs> everybody, you know, okay. grieving is a very, very selfish act. We're grieving for who we've lost, that we've lost that part of ourselves because they've gone on. But at the same time, we have that joy that they're not in pain anymore. Did that answer your question? I don't know. <laughs> certainly, certainly. Okay. It can help to explain, of course. Okay, so uh, please feel free to come up to the microphone and assist me in asking the questions. Thank you. A wonderful panel. I just I wanted to ask you about cannabis and prophecy, or the use of cannabis as a uh, vehicle to, for people to kind of get into a prophetic state, to talk about the future, to talk about their... And, you know, there was a gentleman who just died recently, Mr. Gaskind. He'd founded the farm in Tennessee. Uh, and the New York Times obituary that was published on him, they said that w he said that one of his greatest gifts was to be able to talk stoned more cogently longer than any anybody else. Something like that. That was his sort of statement. I thought that was a wonderful thing that they wrote in the New York Times about this man. And I remember uh, Chris has, has a video on cannabis in ancient Greece about the oracle at Delphi and the idea of using cannabis potentially as the vehicle for some of these or oracles and prophets. And I'm, I'm asking because I had this similar kind of experience with my friends in college where we had used cannabis and it just seemed like we were in this sort of mode where we could talk about the future or ourselves and we thought we were crazy. Or, you know, so what, what, is, what, is, what is that and how, can, how does that play into cannabis and spirituality from your work? Um, yeah, you know, that's real common use of cannabis, cannabis for divination, and that would have been how the, Moses would have used it or they, how they use it in Assyria. And in the new book I'm working on about cannabis and the occult, we have examples from like the 12th century, Sefer Raziel, where cannabis is used for uh, scrying in a mirror, for mirror divination, where you stare into an opaque mirror and things come back. I think what it is, is it, it's throwing into kind of a right brain trance, if not maybe into a, some sort of a trance where you're accessing deeper levels of consciousness having to do with instinctual function. Carl Jung said the collective unconscious is basically the instinctual function in humanity. And uh, um, it, that is a real prevalent use it, for, for cannabis, uh, particularly 19th century occultism, uh, where it was used a lot for divination purposes. The whole foundation of spiritualism uh, uh, in the 19th century started with people like Louis Alphonse Cahagné, who were experimenting with very large doses of cannabis. And uh, there's been a number of prophetic books from that time period written where things actually came true, predicting the railroad road and other things like that uh, um, were, were foreseen somehow under the influences of cannabis, you know? But cannabis, cannabis in itself is a tool. Uh, the spiritual realm and sort of which you sort of entered isn't dependent specifically on cannabis. The most, like, say the spiritual experiences I've had, I've had some on cannabis, I've had the most profound ones on ayahuasca, I've had ones on LSD, and some of the best ones I've ever had have come via the drum, right? So it's, it's, ne it's just you use cannabis as a tool to get there, just like anything else is a tool. Eventually, you know, like the ladies of the drum circle, it was a drum, they drum, they drum the rhythmic harmic beat until they entered a, a dreamlight state. The, wor the dervishes, they would spin themselves until they got dizzy, and they would ent enter into a dreamlight state, right? The, the Native Americans would have this, this, the, the sun dance where they tie themselves to a pole, and, and they're out there for days on end until they enter uh, a spiritual state, right? So really, it, this cannabis is just a tool that can be used to enter or exit or visit or... And because rest assured that you and your friends weren't crazy, so that's okay. <laughs> Let me Lots just, of us have been there. Oh. It slows down time. Mm -hmm. And when I was in my NDE, there was no time. And I've tried ayahuasca, I've tried the mushrooms, I've tried them all. And they're all wonderful, but for me, the cannabis creates the same timeless sense that I had in my near-death experience. And in that timelessness, it's like you can reach to other times. You can, you, can, you can feel it. Maybe I can't verbalize it, but it's there. It's a sense. So I, if I was going to try to do prophecy, which I never have, I would choose cannabis as my way to do it. <laughs> 
that's it. That's right. okay. Next question, please. Brought to mind, uh, the woman, unfortunately, I can't remember her name, but the woman who lived with Stanley Owsley on and off for many years, uh, she wrote a book which, among other things, contains numerous minute details about the manufacturing process. And uh, Owsley was, uh, he was pretty much obsessed with the purity of his intention when he was making LSD. And uh, one of the interesting things uh, I learned in this book was that uh, like, uh, someone else, maybe even her, I'm not sure, but uh, would Du uh, completely duplicate his manufacturing process, but the quality would be substantially inferior. And of course, that's all, all to do with the, uh, you know, the idea of intention that, that you've been discussing. I, I found that quite interesting. Mountain girl. <laughs> no. no? no. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, would you would like, we have two minutes in total, but please, Stephen. You I, I just want to make a general comment, not a specific response to that gentleman, just uh, I think uh, what uh, I was having this discussion with a woman a little earlier this morning. Uh, right now, cannabis is kind of uh, the foot in the door, the thin edge of the wedge, you know. And uh, but what really where we're going with all this, I think, is to understand that we have a relationship, living, communicative, two-way communicative relationship with everything. That our particular cultures, these modern, dominant Western cultures, whatever you want to call them. Uh, have eradicated from our consciousness. Um, but the, the way forward, as I understand it, in my limited understanding, is that uh, we need to reconnect with plants altogether and their, their uh, messages and teachings for us, whether it's medicinal, spiritual, whatever. So I just wanted to add that little bit in there. Um, okay. Any last, last question? My name is Mandalena, and uh, I'm just going to say that I'm not a religious person, um, but I do find a lot of parallels, and I, I found that this discussion was really helpful, actually. Um, I have PTSD, and I'm growing my own plant for my own purposes, and I think that intention uh, piece is really interesting. Um, if you guys don't mind talking about tips or tricks or your own personal uses for when you grow your own plants for your own medicinal purposes. Uh, the, the one thing I'd like to bring up is, uh, and at one time it was, it was an issue for me, but the, the sort of ladies of the drum circle, circle helped me with it, and it was being a, a practitioner of medical cannabis, because once you started applying intention to make people feel better, it was, a, it was like a gate, a connection, a connection to the person that was feeling better, no, uh, and that en energy has a direct link back to you. And if, and if you don't have techniques to sort of release and let that energy flow, then the person actually that can grow the cannabis can actually not necessarily get the same symptoms, but sick or irritable or cranky or, or a, lot of the, a lot of these things. And, and I had some pretty interesting discussions with the ladies about just the cycle of, of energy, right? Energy doesn't, isn't created or destroyed. It just sort of changes form. And if you open up that connection to help somebody feel better, then you better be prepared to receive what comes back. And if you're not, and if it's sort of some black, goopy, dark sort of energy that, you know, comes and sort of attaches itself to you, you better sort of have a trick to sort of get rid of it. And it's interesting, it brings up a story. I remember the first time I tried to do uh, a drum journey on my own, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go meet the spirit of cannabis, and it's gonna give me all these insights, and I'm gonna smoke this big giant fatty before I go. And uh, so I smoked the fatty, and uh, this, essentially this dark black energy landed on top of me, and I couldn't breathe, and essentially had a death and dying experience from it. And the ladies sort of told me that, that when I smoke the cannabis, there is a, there's a veil of sort of non-ordinary reality to, to, to ordinary reality. And when I smoke that cannabis, I knock the door down. And whatever was on the other side, and they, they theorized that it was probably something from my past that I just hadn't dealt with. And it, it saw me through the door, and it wanted to deal with me right away. So it came through and just sat on me and became this sort of dark energy, right? So there are like, like whip tricks of, of snapping your fingers and sort of doing stuff to sort of dissipate that energy, but, but just to be aware of that energy that sometimes it can accum accumulate. And if you don't have techniques to dissipate it, then, you know, be if, cranky. Very quick, last, last seconds answer if, by If, if cannabis panelists. is medicine, then growing cannabis is therapy. We have this intense relationship with cannabis because for 
at least 10,000 years. It's been growing in our waste, the night soil, and this has created a biofeedback loop between us and the plant itself. As we ingested it, it's ingested us. And uh, that probably has a lot to do with the intense medical qualities it offers the human species. It's, a, it's an energy medicine. You gotta get out of your head and let the plant do its work. And the breath, the medium of the breath, breath of life, right? Last words, Barbara. Okay, just to address PTSD specifically, I have a case study in my book, and that case study is me, because I have PTSD. And I mean, I have been washed and dried in therapy my whole life. I have been through every kind of therapy, every kind of workshop, you name it. But there's always been that thread of angst that's hard to explain, but it's in my being. And it, it, you know, if something triggers me, it's right back here again. So Charlie, a few years ago, invited me to try CBD. No THC, just pure CBD. And that was the key. The angst is, is, thank goodness, is gone now. I take CBDs in the morning when I wake up. I take them again when I go to sleep. And I don't have PTSD anymore. All so right. wonderful. Yeah. OK, great. Thank, thank you again for everyone on the panel. Uh, sincerely, may the universe bless your path and your individual mission and for everything wonderful that you bring to the communities around you. Again, my privilege to be up here with you, and thank you for everyone.